Hello everyone. Uh, so this is the second part of the rhetoric review. This is going to pick up right where we left off. Um, just, I know things got a little crazy there at the end. Um, I just want to mention pathos again. Um, the best way to hook your reader and to also maintain their uh, interest is through emotional appeal or ethical appeal, or both, really. Excuse me. So if you, um, it's a great way to hook the reader. Um, for example, if you're writing a research paper, you could hook them through some kind of emotional appeal, some sort of emotional connection to the, uh, to the argument. I once, um, I love animals. Um, I have two dogs. And um, I once had a student write a research paper about puppy mills, which, you know, are really bad. Um, and knowing her audience, knowing me, and knowing that most people like dogs, she uh, began that paper, she hooked the reader with that paper, and this was in English 100, not in 281, uh, with, you know, a hypothetical dog um, that had a lot of health concerns because of, um, you know, the issues that arise in puppy mills. And it was a great emotional appeal to hook the reader. Uh, Talos uh, meant attitude in ancient rhetoric, um, and then it now means purpose in contemporary rhetoric. Purpose is something we're going to talk about a lot. Kairos meant the elements of speech um, in ancient rhetoric, and in contemporary rhetoric it means um, setting. And setting in this sense is not what you think, but we're going to get there. All right, so a uh, review of the rhetorical situation. Now this is a review of the contemporary of contemporary rhetoric. So these are the uh, the terms that we are going to be using: author, audience, and purpose. These three we're going to come back to over and over and over again. Text and setting are um, also very important. They are um, important in contemporary rhetoric. Setting is going to be important in our analysis. Um, however, these two are probably not going to be of that big of a concern for. Um, uh, for you actually uh, creating your own pieces. So author, you are all authors. Um, this is the first thing you need to keep in mind. And it's important to note that the word author is actually derived from the word authority. So as an author, you are the authority of what is being written. Okay, you have to be credible. Uh, we have to trust you. We have to believe you. And you have to be effective at manipulating us. Okay. Um, there are a couple stories that I don't, that we're going to read, because they are important stories in literature, um, but I don't particularly like them. I have problems with them, and I, I, in many of those cases, it has to do with author and authority, of um, where it seems like the writer um, might not necessarily know what they're talking about. They might not necessarily be the authority on what they're trying to convey. Audience. Audience is very important. You always must keep your audience in mind when you're writing. You always must write for your audience. Um, in the context of this class, you are it's me, your instructor, and then all of you who are um, who are college students at Elizabethtown College. Um, it would not be appropriate necessarily for you to write a children's story for this audience. Okay. A better example, and I always use this um, because it's kind of ridiculous and absurd, but I think it makes a good point. <clears throat> if I was going to write some kind of an article about, or some kind of scholarly article about um, atheism um, and some sort of atheist manifesto about why atheism is better, I would not try to publish that in a Christian journal or a religious journal of any kind because it's not the right audience. So you'll always need to keep your audience in mind. Purpose, you must always have a clearly defined purpose. What are you trying to achieve? Um, there's three basic purposes that I mentioned in the last video to inform, persuade, entertain. Those are sort of the bottom of the pyramid. But from there, you know, what are you trying to make us think, feel, or believe by the end? Um, you have to always keep that in mind and always be working towards that. All of this being said, we will also use these sort of in a backwards way to analyze the pieces that we write. Um, who's the author? 
Are they the authority? What is the influence of their background? This is very important, and I just skipped over it. Um, we all have unique experiences. We come from different places, different families, different backgrounds, different beliefs. And in that, we have our own um, sort of unconscious biases. So a lot of that comes through in our writing. And as we analyze some of these stories, we will spend a lot of time talking about the author's background, their personal experiences, their life. You know, why did they write what they did? Um, there's this uh, Stephen King, uh, this great example. Stephen King, uh, he has stated and written about this, that his uh, favorite question to be asked during an interview is, uh, you know, why do you write what you write? Why do you write such dark stuff? Um, and then he always throws it back on the interviewer. What makes you think I have a choice? Um, that's what he says. So um, we are, as writers, we are sort of made. We're the products of our experience in our um, environment, our lives, our childhoods, whatever. And we often don't have much of a choice over what we want to write about. Um, everything I write um, sort of follows a similar sort of thematic progression that is very much based on my own experience. Um, text. Text is very simple. It is just the medium used for the communication. In this case, it's going to be a short story. But it could be a speech, it could be a radio broadcast, it could be um, an email, whatever. Um, and setting, setting is very important. Setting, it has to do with the time and place a piece was written, not the time and place it, in which it was set. And this becomes very important in understanding um, context. Um, that being said, here's a couple of sort of ridiculous or sort of obvious examples like Romeo and Juliet. That would never be written today. Families don't typically, we don't typically have warring families anymore. The Great Gatsby wouldn't be written today. It's not applicable. Bootlegging is not an issue anymore. Jazz Age, the death of the American dream. These things have all already been written about for decades. Fight Club. Fight Club most likely also would not be written today um, because this was very much grounded in the boredom of the 1990s. So time and place creates the context for which we then understand um, why something was written and why it's important. The first two stories you're going to read are by Edgar Allan Poe. And, you know, without understanding the setting, the time and place they were written, which provides the context, these stories would seem very, very odd. Okay. Um, all right. So I believe this is the last slide. There might be one more, but this is more for you, you visual people. I'm going to move this up here. Um, so this is basically a visual representation of what rhetoric looks like. Um, this is Aristotle's rhetoric. This is modern rhetoric. So what this is trying to show is that um, the situation dictates everything. Is it a speech? Is it a piece of writing? Whatever. Um, what kind of a speech is it? Where's the speech at? That sort of thing. Um, ethos, um, speaker and writer. Pathos, audience emotional appeal. Logos, message, reason. These all directly influence each other in an equal way. And then in the middle, binding all of it together is the purpose. All right. Um, that's great. That's fine. But I want us to focus over here. So this is the modern contemporary uh, or the contemporary rhetorical triangle. It's very similar, but you see some differences. So there's the speaker, the writer, the subject, the topic, and then the audience, the reader. Um, again, these all directly influence each other. Um, and then the purpose is what binds them all together. But what um, not only do these influence each other in the decisions that the speaker or writer makes, but it also influences the decision upon the genre that you write in or that you speak in. Um, like I said, within this class, um, our genre is going to be short fiction or research papers. But that's not always the case. You may know you have to communicate something. You have to then decide what's the best way of doing it, what's the best medium, uh, what genre should I write it in? What kind of language should I use? What kind of style? Those sorts of things. And then again, this all falls within context, um, which is basically the same as situation. Okay. Um, I believe that is it. Yes. All right. That is going to be it for um, 
the rhetoric review.